let no one mistake us for the fruit of violence, but that violence, having passed through the fruit, failed to spoil it. Ocean Vuong. The women in my family apologize with a cut fruit. The Korean word for apple is the same word for apology. We offer fruits to mourn our dead, and despite all of this, this country has never offered apologies or fruits of any kind. Yet, still we exist here. Still, we blossom in soil they tried to poison. My mother talks to her plants every morning, says touching dirt is good for your spirit. And what a miracle this is, to grow somewhere we once had no roots. There is no Korean word for queer, but there is a word for survival. There is a word for love. There is a word for apple or apology. There is a word for pear or ship or stomach, which is to say there is a word for vessel. Perhaps this is enough for us now. Hello, I'm George Takei. It's my great honor to introduce our keynote speaker for this summit, Representative Pramila Jayapal. Congresswoman Jayapal represents the 7th Congressional District in the great state of Washington, which includes much of Seattle. Born in Chennai, India, she came to the United States at the age of 16 to study at Georgetown University. Elected to Congress in 2016, Representative Jayapal has the distinction of being the very first South Asian American woman to be elected to the House, and she currently is the chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, the largest and most powerful bloc on the Hill with 97 members. Representative Jayapal is no stranger to progressive causes, having relentlessly championed civil rights, particularly the rights of immigrants, for more than two decades. During the Trump years, she was one of 45's chief critics, pushing back hard against threats to end temporary protective status for immigrants and offering a path to remain for thousands. She's also no stranger to LGBTQ plus causes. In the House Judiciary Committee hearing on the Equality Act, Representative Jaipal told a heartfelt story about being mother to a gender non-conforming child. She stated on Trans Day of Visibility, as the proud mom of a trans kid, I know how beautiful it is when trans and non-binary people are able to live freely as themselves and free from discrimination. These words mean so much to a community under constant attack from the right and to the kids who need to hear that people in power have their backs. It is my great honor to welcome Representative Pramila Jayapal to speak today at the Human Rights Campaign's AAPI and PROUD Summit. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you so much, George, for that tremendous work uh, that you have done to lift up the AAPI community and our challenges and our contributions and to constantly give us hope. And thank you also to the Human Rights Campaign for shining a spotlight on our AAPI LGBTQ community. It is truly an honor to be with some of the nation's leading Asian American and Pacific Islander advocates for LGBTQ rights. As you heard from George, I am the first and only South Asian American woman to serve in the US House. I will not be the last, but perhaps most important today, I am also the proud mom of a transgender child. So the cause of LGBTQ equality is both political and personal. 
I have always been a strong ally to the LGBTQ community, working to pass marriage equality in my home state of Washington, and specifically working over a decade to engage immigrant communities in that fight. But a couple of years ago, when my child, Janak, came out as trans, I saw from a mother's perspective the heavy burden that so many LGBTQ people bear in every moment of every day. And I also saw the beautiful freedom that comes from being fully and authentically yourself and contributing your whole self to our society to bring creativity and brilliance and self-expression into a world that needs more beauty, more hope, and more love. When I spoke out about Janak during that hearing on the Equality Act and became the first member of Congress to do so, one of the things that happened that was so incredibly beautiful was that AAPI kids and parents around the country began emailing me. They emailed me to thank me for seeing them, for hearing them, for standing for them. And they also uh, emailed me to ask questions as parents and LGBTQ individuals in the AAPI community about struggles that they were having. So we started a conversation in our community that continues today about the very complex and intersecting challenges that are faced by AAPI LGBTQ plus individuals. As a parent and as a legislator, I am fully aware every single day the trans folks of color are the tip of the spear. I am aware that my own child faces hate and discrimination in far too many places across this country. I am aware that we are facing white supremacist violence in this country fueled by fear and hateful rhetoric from the right and that reported anti-Asian hate crimes more than quadrupled last year making us hold our loved ones tighter than ever and making us more resolute than ever that we cannot accept this or be silent. I am also aware that LGBTQ plus Asian Americans, especially immigrants, must navigate unique obstacles like being frequently overlooked by researchers and lawmakers, obscuring our experiences and leaving us with practically no data on this particular set of communities. And as I heard from so many AAPI trans kids and parents, despite rich traditions, recognizing people of diverse genders and sexualities in many of our cultures, traditional notions of familial duty and sacrifice can make it especially difficult for our AAPI LGBTQ folks to come out to their parents. Research tells us that only 19% of AAPI children report feeling confident that they can be themselves at home, and only 29% feel confident that they'd be accepted at school. So where does that leave us? I'm a proud organizer with several decades of organizing for change, and I believe that that change is happening right now thanks to the work that so many of you are doing. In Congress, we have worked to raise these issues up constantly. We passed resolutions in the House condemning all forms of anti-Asian hate. Just last year, we formed a new transgender task force, which I am proud to co-chair. And in that role, I co-led a House resolution recognizing the International Day of Transgender Visibility. I am also an original co-sponsor of a resolution calling out the anti-trans hate on the rise across the country. And I'm a proud co-sponsor of a bill that would ban conversion therapy, which inflicts unimaginable trauma on LGBTQ youth. And of course, I am so proud that the House of Representatives has passed the Equality Act twice, and we simply need the Senate to do the same. But I also know that we have a long way to go. Last year, 147 anti-trans laws were introduced in state legislatures. In 2021, more than 55 trans people, largely women of color, were murdered. And a dangerous bill advancing in Florida right now would ban the discussion of LGBTQ identity and history in schools, isolating LGBTQ youth and silencing teachers. And even amid a national blood crisis, the FDA still prevents gay men from donating blood, while Republican lawmakers are fighting to carve out exceptions to LGBTQ rights that the Supreme Court has already recognized. So my ask of you is this, 
Make your voices heard. Tell your stories. Send a clear message that our movement for trans equality is growing and that our courage only builds out of every crisis we face. Our movement is growing in every community, including in the AAPI community. Lift your voices to demand that AAPI LGBT community is seen, heard, and listened to. That we will have more LGBTQ and AAPI folks running and getting elected at all levels of government because we know that that makes an enormous difference on the stories that are told and the policies that are made. Most importantly, I want you to know this. You are powerful. We are powerful. The AAPI community is mobilizing, and that's why voter turnout among Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders had the largest increase of any other category in 2020, and we are only just getting started. We are a strong, resilient, and proud community, and we will bring our full selves in all of our beauty to this movement for justice. I am so proud to be your ally and to help move these issues forward, not just through legislation, but through our narrative, through the narrative that we create that is about the truth of our lived experiences across the country within our AAPI LGBTQ community. So thank you all so much for what you do and for having me here today to say that we stand with you, we see you, we hear you, and we will fight for you. Thank you, Representative Jayapal, for that uh, very inspiring keynote address. My name is Jay Kuo, uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm a member of the Human Rights Campaign National Board of Directors. We know we only have you until around seven o'clock, so we might have a time for one or two questions from our audience. Uh, these were sent in advance from our committee. Um, so the, with your permission, the first question is from Alan. Uh, what can we here in the audience do to help push for progress and use our power within our communities to bring about positive change? Yeah, well, thank you for that, um, for that question. And look, I am an organizer. I believe that we build power through our voices and through our votes and through our organizing. And I would say that really voters are the engine of democracy. The ballot box is among the easiest ways to make change. And I think that there are certainly those amongst us who can't yet engage in the electoral process due to immigration status or Perhaps you're not old enough to be a voter yet, but I can tell you that in the uh, immigrant rights organization that I formed in the wake of 9-11, we had everybody out there, including people who weren't able yet to vote, but could tell their story and it really impose on people the necessity of doing the right thing for all of us, including those who can't necessarily cast a vote. And so Everyone can make their voices heard by mobilizing and by organizing on the streets and online to keep the public pressure on lawmakers at every level of government. And perhaps the most important thing here is that, look, the, the opposition is always looking to discourage us. They're always looking to let us think that we don't have power. And what I have found time and time again through Movements for Change is that that usually happens, that backlash usually happens when we actually are gaining power. That is what scares people. So just know that this backlash is coming in part because we are powerful. So just don't give that up and let's mobilize, let's organize, let's make our uh, voices heard at the ballot box, let's run for office um, and let's continue to build what is already a growing movement for change. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Representative Jayapal. That's actually all the time we have, but you are an incredible inspiration for us. Uh, and please know how much we appreciate you for joining us this evening on this, at this very special summit. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank all you so, so much. Hello, everyone. Welcome to HRC's first AAPI and Proud Summit. It is so wonderful to see you. My name is Betty Paging Sun. My pronouns are she, her, hers. 
and I have the utmost honor of serving on HRC's National Board of Governors and co-chair for the Louisiana Gala. And uh, for too long, the fight for LGBTQ plus liberation, the voices of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders has been toned down, quiet, or missing. Betty and I are among a group of AAPI and proud leaders and allies working within HRC to build visibility and action for our communities. We are delighted that you are here. Together, we can harness the power of our intersectionality to influence and change and make lasting political impact. Jay and I are pleased to co-host this first national summit and you will hear from other members of our working group in today's program. We would like to thank all of our committee members for their inspiring work and vision. Please show them some love. And now for this evening's panel, AAPI and LGBTQ plus change leaders, the power of intersectionality. It's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished moderator, Dr. Priya J. Shah, who teaches gender studies at California State Fullerton and is a member of HRC's Parents for Transgender Equality National Council. Welcome Priya, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Um, it is such an honor to be here, especially to follow Congresswoman Jayapal, who is, as you may imagine, a hero of mine and my daughters. I'm the proud mother of a South Asian American LGBTQ child. As an educator, a mother, and as an advocate for transgender students and racial justice in K through 12, I am very well acquainted with the challenges that our AAPI LGBTQ plus siblings face on a daily basis, even in blue states like California where we are. But perhaps more importantly, I have the privilege to witness the ways in which LGBTQ plus AAPI people use their difference as a strength, as a superpower. And that's really what I am so excited to talk to with our panel today. So I can't see the rest of the panelists. I just wanted to make sure everybody's there. Thank you. Um, to begin with, I would just love, we, you know, many of you need no introduction, but I'd love if you could tell us three things about yourself. The last being how intersectionality or your unique positionality has been a superpower for you. And perhaps Skylar, we will start with you. Sounds good. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm also just uh, very emotional from um, watching your representative's speech. It's so lovely to see that kind of um, allyship. Um, my name is Skylar. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I would say that my intersectionality comes in, in several different ways, but I am Asian American. I'm also mixed race. So my mom is Korean. My dad is white. Uh, and from a very early age, I, I, I learned what it was to be stuck in between. And I think that intersectionality ha has really been the, the primary part of my existence through the world because of that, especially when then I became an athlete and a student and when I became somebody who learned that, that they are transgender, right? Um, and that I had to kind of straddle gender in some ways. Um, and then when you add all those things together, they're sort of like a 1% of a 1% of 1%. And it's been really lovely to be able to um, use the many different ways I've been perceived and the many different ways I can identify myself in order to connect with other people. So I truly think intersectionality, though sometimes can feel lonely, um, it absolutely is a superpower. Thank you. And Skylar, you're so humble. So I'm going to brag on you a little bit. Um, Skylar is the first trans athlete to compete in any sport on an NCAA Division I men's team and for four years. Internationally celebrated speaker and advocate for inclusion, body acceptance, and mental health awareness. It is truly an honor to meet you today. Um, I would like to turn next to Assemblymember Evan Lowe. It's so wonderful to see you, Assemblymember Lowe. Um, you come from the 28th Assembly District in California, Silicon Valley, which is my home. From I'm from, originally from the Bay Area. Um, I wish I still lived there so you could be my Assembly member. But I would love to hear your answer to the same question. 
three things about yourself and how your unique positionality has really been a superpower for you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to HRC for recognizing our diverse communities and uh, helping to uplift our API community as well too and the intersectionality that exists. And you're hearing these stories so uh, abundantly clear. And of course, uh, to help make sure that we have leadership uh, on the board of directors as well too. So a uh, big shout out to our Bay Area friends too. Uh, I see you, Frank and Jay. And Betty, thank you all for all for that you do, um, and David. Um, but you know, from the specific nature of the narrative, I was supposed to become a doctor or a lawyer like my my father, and not get into politics. We tend to just keep to ourselves, but we realize the importance of being engaged. And how do we not? We we're, were constantly being attacked. And I lived in a generation during Proposition 8 in 2008, which eliminated the rights of same-sex couples to marry and that I could serve as mayor for a city, but I couldn't get married myself. I could officiate a wedding, but couldn't get married myself. I could host a blood drive on city hall property, but I could not donate blood myself. Uh, and so this leads to the importance of being engaged in that perspective. And um, we are in a fortunate time in which uh, we're also trying to do all that we can and with the recent uh, um, attack on our trans brothers and sisters and young individuals in Texas. And so how do we not be engaged? How do we not be involved? And we know that this is a pendulum. So we have much work to do and that we realize the importance of our community. So I hope, number one, that we all recognize the, the important uh, need for love and empathy, but also to be as networked as possible and that we're doing incredible work. And I see my dear friend Jennifer at a different time zone as well too. Uh, so we're watching um, and so we're a global world. So let's be as interconnected as possible. This work is difficult, but it requires us to recharge and to love each other. Thank you so much, Assembly Member. Um, I want to come back to that idea of loving one another um, after this question, because I think that's an incredibly important part of what we do once we find our strength. Um, so to turn it over then to your friend, Jennifer Liu. Um, Jennifer is the executive director of the Taiwan Equality Campaign and played a leading role in achieving marriage equality in Taiwan. You are a HRC global innovator, and we are so thankful to you for coming early in the morning um, from your time zone to join us today. So Jennifer, if I could also ask you that question, how has your unique positionality kind of shaped the work you do? And what are a few very interesting things about yourself? And I think you still might be muted. See if we can get your volume going. Awesome. Because the, the, the room told me I couldn't unmute myself, so I was really <laughs> helpless. Okay, so um, hello everybody. I'm Jennifer Lu. I'm from Taiwan, Taipei. And right now it's um, 8 a.m. in the morning, so very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm a Taiwanese lesbian social worker advocate and uh, one interesting thing is my grandmother is Japanese and there are some complicated and interesting history between Taiwan and Japan and um, also I'm also a caregiver in my family. I support my mother to take care of my younger sister for 20 years and my uh, younger sister who um, passed away eight years ago due to her biological uh, severe um, heart disease. And I think that experience provide me an opportunity to realize and think about uh, in my very early childhood, um, and what is the most important thing in our life? Because you only live your life for one time. And, and that also provide me an opportunity to uh, learn from our loved ones, to treasure our life and do the most uh, important thing. Um, so I choose to... Uh, use my um, my ability to change uh, my country and and that's something I really want to share uh, after. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. And last but most definitely not least, um, mm -hmm. my dear friend and fellow mama bear, 
<laughs> Marsha Azumi. Um, if many of you already know Marsha, but she is an author, educator, LGBTQ plus activist, and proud mother of a transgender son, and currently serving on the PFLAG National Presidents Council. She's also the founder of Okiri, a Nikkei LGBTQ plus community that provides support to Japanese LGBTQ plus individuals and their families. So Marsha, if you could share a little bit more about yourself and then speak to your unique positionality. We already start to see it in the work that you do, but if you could expand on that a little bit more for us. Sure, thank you so much, Priya. Um, I, well, you already mentioned, I'm the proud mother of a transgender son, and I have a second son who I consider Aiden's strongest ally. Um, I have been married for, next month, I'll be married for 50 years. And the reason I bring that up is because I couldn't do this work without my husband. If he wasn't there to support me um, in so many ways, I couldn't have done the work that I'm doing. Um, I think my intersectionality um, falls within three different areas. Um, being Asian, um, being a mother, of course, and also my educational background. Um, I um, work in the education field. Um, and I think the, the Asian piece that I bring is um, I bring an awareness of our culture, especially um, in the Japanese culture. Some of the things that maybe others aren't so, don't have to deal with as much, such as, you know, our honor, our saving face, our um, strong family uh, connection, like our collective mentality. Um, also, our respect for our elders, all of these things we bring to the work that we do. And so I bring that as an Asian individual. As an educator, I just want to educate everybody about LGBTQ, about transgender. And I think I, I bring that in so many ways. Um, being an author, Aiden and I have written a book. I think we do speak in many different circles and we just want to raise awareness. But the, the, thing I, the thing I bring, I'm very emotional for all of you who don't know me, but the thing that I bring the most is just my love. Um, I think as a mother, you bring your strong love. And for me, what that has done um, is not, so, not just I love Aiden, that's how I started, but I have fallen in love with this LGBTQ community that is so vulnerable and courageous and amazing. So when I'm scared, my love makes me brave. And I think I see that so much in our community and I get inspiration from all the people that are doing this work and all the people that are here. So um, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Now I'm crying, Marsha. <laughs> I already cried during the keynote <laughs> along with Skylar. Um, <laughs> so one of the stereotypes that is often attached to our various Asian American identities is um, a passivity or a quietness. Um, and I'm sure you all would agree with me that that's not an accurate <laughs> uh, characteristic. You know, we're, a, we're not a monolithic group with just one set of characteristics. However, there has been a dearth of Asian American voices and especially LGBTQ plus Asian American voices in the discourse. And so what I wanna ask you is, how did you find your voice? Because it's often only when we um, accept our differences as what makes us unique and strong that we can then share it with the world. Uh, then we can speak our truth and fight for others as well. So what if we um, start this time with Jennifer? If you could share your discovery moment. Sure, um, I think uh, that was my very first time to stand on the stage uh, when I was 20. Um, so I was um, invited by uh, a, 
a social worker from Taiwan Tongzhi Hotline Association, which is the oldest um, and biggest LGBT organization provide the services um, in Taiwan. So I was the volunteer in that organization. So that uh, I remember there was one time and um, the social worker asked me, do you want to go to the senior high school to share your uh, stories with the uh, students? So I think that was my very first time to, to start to realize that, oh, I am powerful to share my own stories because I was always feel I'm a little different from my friends. And um, because of my younger sister, I, I, I just, um, uh, I mentioned, I start to think about the meaning of our lives um, in a very early childhood. And, and also I'm not the, that kind of traditional <laughs> woman in Taiwan. So I always loud and have a lot of opinions and try to intervene uh, intervene everything um, in my family. So I'm, I feel a little um, awkward sometimes, actually a lot of times um, when, I, um, when I was a young a little girl. And so, so standing on that stage, um, that, uh, that, that's one thing I realized I want to do. I want to change people's hearts and mind by telling, telling my story. And the, still, the story actually um, at that time, I didn't have the courage to, to talk about in my family. And so that provide me uh, some practice opportunity to uh, learn how to say and how to uh, use um, the stories to encourage people. And I felt really good to take my courage at that time to share who I am, to learn how to um, be who I am. And that also, um, especially, um, I am almost 40 right now, 20 years ago, uh, LGBT issues in Taiwan is really, really a, a, a huge taboo. So I was uh, shamed and don't want to uh, admit I'm a lesbian uh, when I was 20. But um, that experience actually um, really positive. So I, I feel like it's, it's a very unique moment for me. And when you found your courage, you gave so many others courage as well to change an entire nation. I mean, if that isn't um, an inspiration to find our courage, I don't know what is. <laughs> um, <laughs> Skylar, would you answer that question as well? When was your discovery moment where you found you had a unique voice to share with others? It's a, it's a really good question. I was just, I was thinking about it, but then I really was just listening to Jennifer, so not thinking about it again. Um, I, I mean, I, one of the first things I thought of is the similar moment to, to, to Jennifer. I think the first time I gave a speech and stand up and, you know, stood up in front of people and said, hey, this is who I am, um, and, and really watched it actually shift some people's mindsets. I think that would probably be one of the first times. Um, but I also think there were moments in high school when, before I came out as trans, um, where I found my voice in smaller ways. And that the reason I, I say that is because I think I learned um, how to stand up in other ways first, and then I stood up for, for myself as a trans person. Um, and there's one specific memory I have where there was somebody on my high school swim team um, who was very racist and very homophobic and used a lot of different slurs. He was also a person of color. There's a lot of internalization going on there. Anyways, he's a big bully, right? And, um, and I was new to the team and everybody on the team was kind of like, this is fine, this is how it is, that's, that's just how he is. And I was like, absolutely not. I am not putting up with that. I am not dealing with this. He will not call me these names or people I love. Um, and so I started talking back to him and I'd be like, you don't call me that, don't do that, and, you know, and so on. And the more I did it, the more other people did it. And eventually the whole team did it and he actually left the team. Um, and that was sort of a small way that I said, I'm going to stand up for what I believe is right, and also let me let me like, let me see that an actual impact is made. Um, and that wasn't, you know, standing up for a specific identity or a specific person or even really myself, because he was mostly attacking other people. Um, but it, it did show me that I have the power to say something, and that most of the time 
that power that, that will be supported by others, somebody needs to take the first step. Uh, and so I've carried that with me as I've, as I've moved forward through my career. I think you're muted, Dr. Shaw. I love, thank you. I love that story because I realized I asked the question in a simplistic way because it's always more than one moment, right? And we know that um, it, you can, it's often that collection of little moments that takes us to something bigger. Assembly member low, you're one of the best speakers, right? In the assembly, you, it comes to you, it seems to come to you organically, but was there a time when you didn't quite have that voice and what changed? Oh my gosh, I, I, you know, it's a moment of vulnerability. And I'm just, I just think, I think it's so important that we are as authentic as possible. Uh, I was not always like this. I was absolutely that shy, young Asian American kid who was just a gamer and did not have the type of socialization. And in fact, in government and in politics, it sometimes is counterintuitive to our own culture. Case in point, during this Lunar New Year celebration, oftentimes there's the exchange of red envelopes in which there's money inside. Well, typically then we'd say, oh no, please, I, no, no, I don't. Or you would fight over the bill. Um, but in government and politics and in campaigning, you're actually asking people for money, much less saying no to when people culturally give you money for a celebration. So it does require us to get outside of perhaps our comfort zones as well too. And what I've realized is that there are many circumstances in which I would revert to some of my cultural upbringing and tend to not want to say anything. Uh, but if we don't speak for ourselves and advocate for ourselves, how do we expect others to do so for us? And I just cannot but recall that we stand on shoulders of so many who come before us. And you referenced, of course, our co collective roots to the Bay Area. Um, but I, I come from the, the pipeline of Norman Mineta and Mike Honda, two living civil rights icons who were living uh, civil rights icons who uh, lived during the internment camps. And the parallels of the social justice is uncanny, to which brings us to where we are today and the intersectionality and why we cannot forget, which is why we are so passionate and devoted to passing ethnic studies in the state legislatures and across the country so that we remember our history and that we can be interconnected and loving one another. And of course, as we're celebrating Black History Month, we see again the parallels that exist, not far distant in the past, but present. And that's when we talk about solutions to stopping AAPI hate, when we talk about the attacks on our LGBTQ plus community, we must all stand firm in solidarity and advancing these issues, which is why, again, it's so humbling to see HRC helping to convene this conversation with AAP, AAPI community members, but then to take a step further to helping support and uplift the communities and finding out what our call to action then on this call could be, that we are all in a, in a way preaching to each other because we care, but how do we make sure that we're bringing others to this conversation as well and getting them to also participate and join whether as board members, volunteers and uh, contributors to the organization. I, I love the um, bringing it back to history and kind of the commemoration of our history. We just had an anniversary of internment, of course. We're celebrating Black History Month. And here, even in California at our local school districts, we are having to fight um, for ethnic studies. We're being told that our histories are not relevant to other students or that they don't have value. And so these various actions, as you say, are so much a part of what we're doing here as well, is making sure those histories are learned by all. Marsha, your voice um, has uplifted hundreds and hundreds of people. You can see the love coming from the chat as well to you as an author, as an educator. But where did you find your voice? Oh, and I think you're still muted. Marsha, you're still muted, I'm sorry. Oh. There you are. Okay, sorry everyone. Technology is not my strong suit. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, in the beginning, 
people started calling me an activist and I would say, oh no, I'm not an activist. I'm just a mother who loves her son. And I think I was afraid of be, having a voice. I was afraid that to be an activist, you had to be loud. You had to carry picket, you know, protest signs and carry bullhorns. And that just really wasn't me. But one day it was really funny. I remember waking up and thinking, you know, if this world is going to be safe for Aiden, I don't want to be a spectator. I don't want to be sitting outside and expecting other people to do it. I, I want to be part of this, um, this making the world safer. And to be honest, I didn't know how to do it, but I just felt this commitment in my heart that I wanted to do it. And so I just started like, I guess people were, were talking, the other panelists, you know, people asked me to speak. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll go and speak. And I was scared. Um, you know, I knew I would cry. I was shaking. My legs were shaking. <laughs> but I thought, I, I'm, I'm going to do it. And every time I did it, I felt like I'm making the world safer for Aiden. And so I think that's how I started. And I realized the most powerful part of my voice didn't have to be loud and boisterous and, and pushy. It could just be filled with love and vulnerability and compassion. And so that's kind of my, um, that's my comfortable place. And, and I feel like as activists, we have to find our comfortable place. We have to find our place where our, our voice is real and authentic and people can really connect with it because they know we're sincere. Um, I think in my best, in my best situations, I'm courageous and I'm honest and I'm authentic. And I think I learned that all from my son, Aiden. Thank you, Marcia. That's a beautiful tribute I think for those of us here who are cisgender or straight moms of queer kids, that we learn so much from our children. The reason I'm here is my child. The reason you're here is your child. Um, I have a few more questions, but we'll just maybe we'll do one or two responses and then shift over to the next question just for time. And this is another question about um, subverting the stereotypes associated with Asian American cultures. So we're, I'm often asked, I'm a South Asian American, and I'm often asked, oh, did your community turn away from you when your daughter came out? And instead, I would say my helpers were my community. They, you know, that collectiveness that we have in our culture is a beautiful gift we give to one another. And they surrounded us with love and the helpers were the grandparents, truly, who recognize that unconditional love surpasses all of the other things that they still had to educate themselves about. Um, and it took time, but they have been our biggest uh, supporters and allies. So perhaps is there uh, one of you who'd like to answer that question? Who have the helpers been in your journey? Yes, Jennifer, please. Um, I think that's very important because the support system is always crucial for uh, this difficult <laughs> um, journey uh, for being the advocate. And I would say, of course, my sister, um, my parents, and uh, the former colleagues uh, at Halai. Um, but I really want to highlight on uh, my parents today since we are talking about uh, our um, AAPI uh, identity and about that's uh, uh, especially related to our family. And I think it's not easy for uh, Taiwanese parents to allow and support their daughter to do so-called this kind of job. And um, Asian parents always expect their children can honor our families. That means you can be a lawyer, you can be a doctor, and you, you have to get a good grade in schools and um, be the best, being the first one. So... Um, and we, I think, as a child, are uh, educated uh, to please our parents with all these uh, expectations. So the whole society told us you need to save the family's face. So um, I think my parents, um, also, of course, they also have this kind of uh, uh, concept, but uh, they... Uh, have done their best to support me. Uh, although in the very beginning, they actually didn't agree 
uh, with uh, what I want to do, which is doing the protest, telling people I'm a lesbian and share our family stories, especially the family stories, the coming out stories. Uh, my parents had a very difficult time when I came out when I was 19 years old. So um, for them, th this is not a, like um, some amazing moment you can share to other people, especially people you don't know, they don't know. So um, so I, I think that they they their tolerance <laughs> was quite high until right now. Um, and although they didn't realize what I'm doing, they know I gave the speeches and they know I went to schools to share um, some lectures, but they they don't know how to, they didn't know how to tell people what what's my, you know, what's my job. And so uh, even till right now, some of their friends uh ask them do i have salary and they they always think we are because i'm a i'm a social worker people don't understand social worker 20 years ago in taiwan and um and being the advocate uh, uh policy uh change makers they uh people don't understand what you are doing so i think after like 10 to 12 years in in the beginning 10 to 12 years my father really uh, didn't want to share uh, anything about uh, his daughter, and um, but I think um, we we are still do a lot of communication, and I think that's very important. So never turn away to yeah from your families because you you I I always say you you need to have the belief people have the especially your parents have the ability to change. Uh, but you you need to give them time and and keep on the uh, communication channel and um, and so I I I feel very fortunate that uh, my parents didn't uh, intervene <laughs> my my job I think that's the best way the best that I can do uh, at that time yeah Jennifer thank you so much that's. It's so true that there's grace, you know, that we all need to give each other in this process. Um, and Skylar, would you like to share your journey with your Korean grandparents? Sure, yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, my mom is Korean and her family moved to the States in the late 1960s and it was um, her whole immediate family. Uh, and if you, for a second, I know we're trying to dispel stereotypes, but let's bring in the stereotypes just for a second and think about a Catholic immigrant Korean grandmother and then think about queerness, right? Um, I was absolutely terrified to share with my grandmother that I was, that I am queer. And initially I'd come out as a, as a lesbian because I thought that was who I was. And I just flat out didn't tell her. I was like, at some point, maybe I'll marry a woman. And at that point, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> um, but when I came out as trans, I knew I had to tell her, um, you know, my voice sounds different. I could only say I was sick for so long. There's been articles about me. I didn't want her to find out online. Um, so I spent a while trying to figure out how to share this with her. Um, I blocked her on Facebook. So she couldn't, uh, she couldn't find anything on Facebook, which she calls FaceTime. But anyways, um, she does use it, so I blocked her on it. And after a couple months of really thinking about how best to share with her and also working through language barriers, there is no word for transgender. You heard in the poem earlier, there's no word for, for queer. Um, the word for gay is gay e. The word for transgender is tu dan su chen ta. So that doesn't help me, right? Explained what it meant to be transgender. And my mom and I went to go read her this letter absolutely terrified, sure that this was going to be a disownment, but knowing me, especially knowing that I needed to tell her out of respect, right? Um, I sat her down, my grandfather, my great aunt as well, and I said, I'm transgender. Um, I read them the letter and then I, I waited. My grandfather actually began to clap. And he goes, so you come out of closet now. And I was like, how did you, grandfather, I thought you didn't, you barely even speak English. Where did you get the language coming out of the closet? Um, and my grandmother, she's got this super stern look on her face. And she's the one I'm like truly nervous about. Um, my head up, but she has this like head in the clouds. So Harmony, <laughs> my grandmother, she's got this really stern look on her face. She's like, I knew that. I was like, excuse me, what? She's like, I knew that. I saw gay things on FaceTime. And I was like, what are you talking about? 
Um, she says, okay, that's fine. I have two grandsons from your mother. That's fine. My mom is now in tears, but I was like, okay, this is a little too easy. What is the catch here? Like something, something's off. My grandmother launches into the discussion of how it's normal that I'm transgender and how all these things made me transgender. I'm like, what are you talking about? Where did you get this information? And she's like, well, I watched Korean red YouTube internet. I don't know what that is, but it got her there, right? So she says all of this and she pauses and she says, okay, you can be a boy and you can be a brother. She says, you can be a doctor now. I'm like, oh my God, gender roles. Okay, I'm gonna have to get to that one later. She says, you can be a man. But in Korean culture, it is the daughter's responsibility to take care of the parents. It is still your responsibility, Skylar, because your mother has no daughters. It is your responsibility to take care of the parents. And I, I actually said to her, dude, I got you. Don't know why that was my language choice, but <laughs> I actually have her words, pumo hyodo, it means mother, father, filial piety, or take care of your parents tattooed in her handwriting. She knows it's there underneath my mastectomy scar next to my heart. Um, and she, she wrote it out for me. She texted me it. She's very woke actually texting emojis, being affirming of tattoos and transness. Um, and when I sent her a photo of the tattoo, once I had gotten it, she responded with the praying hands emoji like this. And she said, thank you for taking this eternal vow to take care of your parents. Um, but I always like to share that story when we talk about AAPI and or intersectionality with regards to race, um, because my grandmother had every excuse to not accept me, whether that be language, generation, culture, religion. I mean, she goes to church every single day. She could have used any of those reasons to say no. And instead she said yes. And she said that, why? Through love, right? Kind of going back to what you said, Marsha, she led with love. And I think that's an example that anybody can, can, can follow, whether that be other trans people knowing that we deserve that unconditional love and you can you know, receive that harmony love, or maybe you can be somebody else's harmony, maybe not direct bloodline, but you can show other people that unconditional love, no matter what background you come from. Crying again. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that story. It's my pleasure. Talk about authentic. That was her authentic response that comes out of love for you. Um, the last question I would love to ask Assembly Member Lowe and Marsha is: Was there a specific moment that challenged you as an AAPI LGBTQ plus person and leader or an ally? And how did you overcome or approach that challenge? So if we could start with Marsha, please. So I think, uh, I mean, there's so many challenging moments, I think, but I'm gonna go to the very beginning when Aiden first came out. And, um, and what happened to me was I felt that I had brought shame to my family and our family name. I thought I had been a terrible mother because I didn't know, I, I didn't really understand the LGBTQ community. So I thought he was making a choice and I hadn't guided him. So I think for me, it was so important to have organizations like PFLAG, um, you know, that helped me to understand, get support, hear other stories from other parents that were successful. Um, it was important for me to be around uh, my Asian community with Okaidi to, to understand that maybe that's how I felt about the shame and that was my community, but I could be strong enough to overcome that. And I, I, I could overcome it by getting support and being educated. I think those things were so important to me, organizations that are out there with resources and providing uh, information for parents like me, help me um, dispel these stories that are in my head. I mean, after I got support and was educated, I realized it was not a, a choice for my child. Um, it was a choice for me. Was I going to support him and be by his side or was I not? Um, so in the end, for me, I think I bring the best honor to my family and my family's name by standing up for my child, standing by my child. And what that did for me is once I thought I was a bad mother, I realized I'm, I was always a good mother. And I, I just didn't know, I just didn't know. Um, I, I needed more support, I needed more, um, I needed more education. And so today I see 
gosh, I've been a good mother and I just got better. And I am so grateful for my son who has really opened up this whole world for me uh, of, of knowledge, of uh, being able to speak out, for understanding it's not weak to be vulnerable or to reach out for support, it's really strength. And um, so I'm not, a, I'm a good mother. <laughs> I'm a good mother that has gotten better. And I'm so grateful for the journey that has taught me that. And now you're someone who gives those resources to other parents yes. that seek to learn and to, to learn in love for yes. their child. And um, Assembly Member Lowe, if we could end with you, what was the challenge, one of the challenges that you remember and how did you overcome or approach it? Uh, well, Marsha, I hope you'll all adopt us also as uh, your family as well, too, as your honorary family. Uh, there's just so you have so much love to go around. And I know that uh, we would all benefit uh, from having you in our community. So thank you for all that you do for us as well, too. It's always a great reminder. So uh, for those of uh, you on this uh, uh, Zoom now, if you have the pleasure of still having family members around, give them a call and tell them that you love them. Uh, that's so important each and every day. Um, and, and we can't end this without a call to action. Uh, um, amazing, Scholar Jennifer Marshall could all be public servants and helping to shape and be great role models in advancing equality in significant ways. And that's what I think is so important that we have members of our community who are visible in a wide variety of different sectors so that we can be out and proud. And also when you think about our community members who might be hesitant about recognizing the importance of our LGBT community, we can say, yes, that is a phenomenal Olympic skater, that is a great musician, a politician, a doctor, and they're also a member of the LGBT community. I think that's how we're going to change as many hearts and minds as possible. And then finally, a call to action. Advocacy takes hard work and also takes resources. So please find a way to help support HRC financially, help support their local events, help volunteer in your local communities, identify openly LGBT candidates and elected officials and help to support them and advocating for the work as well. We must get into the arena. Politics, I know, is messy and it's dirty and, and sometimes you get ruffled, roughed up a bit, uh, but democracy requires our engagement and that's much more important, requires our AAPI and LGBTQ plus community to be seen, to be heard loud and clear, more so now than ever. So please, let's get involved, participate in, in this organization, and let's help change and the hearts and minds for so many others. I can't add anything more to that. That's a beautiful way to end our panel. I just wanna say thank you to HRC for this space. Um, it's truly something special and unique that we were able to be here together and to all of you for sharing your experiences and wisdom with us. Um, it's incredible and it was in just an honor to be part of this. Thank you. You're muted, Betty. I apologize. Do y'all hear me now? Okay. What an inspiration you all are. Um, wait, are we back? Okay. You all are truly an inspiration. Um, your messages are heartfelt and I truly appreciate HRC for making this platform available for all of us to share our stories, to inspire each other and for everyone to know that it is a safe space. It's okay to share and that we are, there is a community here for you. I, I can't tell you how many times um, I had tears rolling down my face over the last 20 minutes um, as a mother, as an AAPI um, individual at the intersectionality of these marginalized groups. Um, and I, I, your inspiration, your stories are truly inspirational. Thank you so much. Let's show an appreciation to this amazing panel of change leaders 
each of you demonstrate how living authentically and using the unique power of our voices can influence tremendous real change. Thank you all so much. And <clears throat> later tonight, we're going to have a very special and spectacular performance by Broadway leading man, Telly Liang. But first, we want to turn the spotlight over to all of you. Now, a summit is a gathering of leaders, and hearing from you this evening amplifies our voices. Your ideas will focus and refine our next steps as a community, especially in such an important election year, where our opponents continue to attack and challenge our equality on so many fronts. In a few moments, we will invite you to choose a topic to discuss with each guest in our summit, led by our committee members. So our working group came up with these four topics for us to discuss in smaller groups and give you a chance to meet one another. They are as follows, and you'll see the topics here on the slide. Growing AAPI visibility, LGBT groups, uh, to choose that, just stay in the room. Addressing cultural and social biases within the AAPI community. Flexing our political muscle, uh, where I'll be leading that, um, and creating and fostering effective allyship. Uh, we'll discuss these, sorry, we will discuss these topics in smaller groups for 15 minutes and we'll meet back here uh, to hear about top line ideas coming out of each group. Be ready for a lively discussion, but let's all observe a few guidelines before we send you all in. Turn your cameras on, we'd love to see you. Please raise your hands if you have an idea to contribute. Keep your mics muted if you're not speaking. Use your reaction emojis to support another speaker's ideas. There's no need for us to repeat similar ideas. To keep your remarks concise, we'd like to hear from as many of you as possible in a short amount of time. Remember to be kind. Let's make this a safe, welcoming space for our community to share ideas. Have a great discussion. We'll see you back in 15 minutes. We regroup and then enjoy Kelly Delano's performance. So go ahead and choose the group that you'd like to be in. Got it. Hello. Can you all hear me? Great. Yeah, go ahead, Greg. Okay. 
I was, <laughs> I'm going to join Marsha and say that uh, I'm technologically challenged. I'm supposed to be leading this break. And I was like, do you want to start? I go, I can't see anybody. So <laughs> thank you for uh, <clears throat> joining um, our breakout. As we said, we only have 15 minutes today, but we did want to have an opportunity to uh, group meet in smaller groups and uh, um, have conversations in uh, <clears throat> a little bit more conversational setting. Um, but my goodness, it's, uh, it's hard to follow both the, uh, the keynote speaker and that panel because there were so many um, powerful words and, and inspiring um, uh, messages. So I'm going to try to keep this uh, fairly tight in our, in our setup. We have uh, a, a couple of uh, people kind of co-facilitating the session. So um, <clears throat> Don Mike Mendoza, um, Aiden Izumi, and uh, Norm Watkins are going to help me through this. Um, and... Really, I think what we wanted to say, and this may have changed. I am a little bit older than a lot of people in in the uh, uh, in in the breakouts, but um, kind of in my experience, at least starting out back in the I don't know late '80s, early '90s, um, and then even you know a little bit more recently. But a lot of the uh, uh, groups that I belonged to that were LGBTQ were um, not always explicitly inclusive um, and didn't really seek out um, or incorporate a AAPI. Uh, perspectives into programming, resource allocation, um, the way that they organize for activism and other things. So, um, <clears throat> so for me, I think this notion of, and you know, the message came up pretty clear in the earlier sessions, is how do we um, enhance AAPI visibility in some of these more mainstream organizations, and what kind of things can we can we uh, learn from each other? maybe you know, share best practices or other successes that we've had in the past so that um, you know, we as a collective organization can become stronger in, in the work that we do and in, you know, whether it's with the HRC or, or other organizations we belong in or belong to. So um, I'm gonna kind of quickly hand over to Don Mike and see if there's anything else you wanted to add or we can just kind of kick off conversation. Sure, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Don Mike. Um, I'm on the in the working group and part of the host committee. It's so awesome to be here and to hear everybody's uh, stories from the panel tonight and our speakers. Um, just to remind everyone now that we've all kind of divided into the room. Um, just a quick reminder of the guidelines, you know, just please, um, when you answer or speak up, um, we definitely ask across the board just to be respectful of other people's ideas and opinions. Um, you know, we're all here to support each other. Um, and then if you can keep your responses to um, between 30 seconds um, and a minute, um, just so we can get as many voices in the conversation as possible. Um, so feel free to raise your hand using the hand emoji. Um, and then if there's something you agree with, feel free to um, use your reactions to um, support it so we um, can, again, get as many voices in as possible, um, especially if it's um, the same um, opinion. So I'll pass it to Norman if you want to say anything. I just um, am so delighted to be a part of this uh, the summit tonight. Um, I'm, my responsibility here is to take notes and then report back to the main group. So I look forward to hearing a lively conversation. Um, and uh, Greg, back to you. Okay, so um, I think uh, the, the question is um, fairly general to just start us off and just if people have ways, you know, we heard from uh, some of the panelists about ways that they found their voice and uh, um, the power of their I'm going to just say combined, you know, their, their combined identities, the intersection of various parts of their lives and, and giving them sort of the strength and the, the, the will to, to uh, engage a conversation and to affect change. So I wanted to hear from, uh, from this group just to say, you know, what are ways that you have um, used in you know, other organizations that you belong to, to you know, raise AAPI visibility? when some of those, I think even uh, Representative Jai Paul said early on, you know, a lot of times we're not, we're overlooked. Um, and so unless we do raise our hands and say, you know, these are my individual or our community's concerns, sometimes they don't get accounted uh, or taken into account as, as we move forward. So I wanted to know if there were any um, examples that other people had to, to share. And you know, just feel, feel free to unmute yourself and, uh, and speak. I don't think we're going to um, do this in any sort of formal way, just more of a round table. Or you can raise your hand if I can find a hand emoji. Feel free so. to drop it in the chat too. Um, we can read it if you're uncomfortable um, speaking up. You know, we're definitely happy to read any comments that you put inside the chat box.
anybody have anything to uh, to start us off with? Otherwise, I might just uh, call call one of my fellow uh, presenters and ask uh, uh, Aiden or uh, or Norm to kind of start us off with um, organizations that you've been uh, a part of in the past that um, where you've been able to raise uh, API perspectives in in the organization. I don't mind uh, jumping in to give folks some time to to think, um, if that's okay, Greg. Absolutely. Sure. So, um, hi all. My name's Aiden. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and his. Um, I'm Marsha's son, and um, in the work that I've done primarily with our local PFLAG chapter um, in Southern California, I've found that. Um, for me, the, the biggest thing has just been able, being able to share some of those intersections and really like personal things that apply to my identity, identity as, a, as an API person, as a Japanese American. And so um, I used to kind of leave those things out and, and kind of separate sort of my API identity from my, my sort of queer and, and trans identity. And then I've, I learned that that wasn't sort of helping me um, bring these conversations to the table. And so what I found the most helpful is to actually really share and highlight the things that made, um, you know, might be different from my experience because of being uh, Japanese American or Asian American. And so um, really highlighting those in conversation and bringing, bringing it forward so people can actually uh, understand how maybe the needs are different based on community and cultural background. No, I think that's a that's a really important uh, thing, Aiden. And I know the other group is talking about uh, social and cultural biases, but sometimes that is difficult, right? To say, you know, I'm I have grown up kind of not making waves and and being kind of under the radar, and then finding yourself in a situation. Um, and this wasn't for me, at least. I was in a work situation many many years ago, um, but I was specifically choosing. I think because my ethnic identity is always as it is in a corporate setting. Um, I was in this one training session and I was like, you know, I just don't feel like carrying the gay flag today. <laughs> I just, I'm not. And I remember this conversation, it was actually interesting because this is probably in the early nineties, but it was a diversity training as those were back then. And I felt this conversation just kind of sliding into this vague, um, not any sort, there was no heart in that conversation. And I think, uh, I was kept checking myself saying, I don't want to raise my hand. I don't want to be the center of attention. I don't want to speak out. And I was like, and on the other hand, you know, two hours of this breakout session on this topic, you're going to go by the wayside. If I don't actually say, Hey, I am a gay man and this is important to me. And I think it's the same sort of thing when you're in these, uh, some of these other conversations to say, and that doesn't, you know, whatever, wherever this conversation is going, that my, API identity provides a different perspective and maybe a different way of thinking about the issue that had maybe had not been considered. And particularly when you get to some of the political um, <clears throat> stuff, even when Marsha was talking earlier about, you know, the um, <laughs> stereotype of an activist of being loud and being boisterous and being able to march at the front of the crowd. And sometimes that's just not how certain individuals, and certainly for me to say, oh my gosh, I'm going to be that person. So I think that, you know, being able to check what are my own kind of cultural contexts that I operate in every day and, and how do I make that more comfortable? I do remember too, like, um, and again, not necessarily so much on an LBG, LGBTQ uh, context, but I do remember being challenged by my own parents and saying, you know, you're no longer Japanese because you're too outspoken. <laughs> and it kind of hurt me at one point, but also to be able to say, if I want to have a voice, if I want to be effective in a multicultural environment, then I'm going to have to find the strength to speak up, to interject, or the conversation may go on without being relevant to me, let alone whoever else is in, in, in the room. Are there any other uh, perspectives on, on this uh, um, topic? I know we're we're a large group, but uh, a little bit uh, quiet as well. So I'm gonna um, 
Nope, I, is that somebody's hand that I just hey, saw? Jen Jennifer raised her hand. Hey, Jennifer. I was going to say thanks. I just saw a hand and I <laughs> flipped past it. Go ahead, Jennifer. Hi. Um, thank you uh, again for having me. And I, I, I feel so committed um, when I listen to everybody's discussion because <clears throat> in international LGBT occasions, the conferences, international conferences, and, and something like that, I feel always uh, lonely being an Asian activist and also, um, um, also feel like being mm, ignored sometimes um, because especially I think in recent years, the situation getting better and better, but for example, like 10 years or 15 years, and uh, there was always different faces on the stage and uh, I, I, I kind of felt lonely in my country because I'm a lesbian, but when I was in the international LGBT um, movements, occasions, I also feel lonely being an Asian. So, and I, and, and after a few times that experience, I decide I need to say something. <laughs> and so I make a, I made a goal that for myself, and every time I join these kind of international conferences, I, I want to uh, ask questions, only one questions uh, in the biggest um, session and then raise the, uh, this uh, API issues uh, in, that, uh, in, that, in, in that situation. And in the very, like the first time or the second time, I, I was so nervous and because English is not my mother language and, and there are so many people, they feel like I'm a like, like innocent Asian girl. I can see people's uh, feedback from their eyes. So, uh, but after a few times, um, every time I did this action, uh, even only a, a very small question. And after that session, people come to me, especially the activists from other Asian countries, and they uh, they, they 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 feel. Um, they feel connection when they see someone who is Asian and raise the question or raise the issues. And so, um, so I, I just want to share this experience. I know sometimes um, it feels so uncomfortable to be the center of the group. And I, I, I felt the same way as well uh, for many years. But um, right now, I try to balance to choose the moment I I can I'm comfortable with and do some small actions, and I think that's really helpful um, in the like larger international LGBT movement to to that people understand we are still need to look up. Uh, uh, more like intersectionalities and there's a lot of things we still need to uh, discuss on the table yeah that's my feedback thank you <laughs> thanks Jennifer and I think that's a great point I think when you said uh, you know find the right moment sometimes it is a timing thing right is assessing who your audience is who, who else you're trying to influence and finding the right time when they are maybe most receptive so thank you for that comment um, we've also have two hands raised, Glenn, and I'm going to try to unmute you. I don't know if I can. Um, I've asked. Hey, it's oh, Glenn. How are you? There you go. You're doing great. <laughs> so, um, you know, I just want to comment and say, I've, I've been doing this work for a very long time and I can do this work and I've done this work because of the people that are here now. I mean, David, you, hi, David. You know, Lonnie, James, Aiden, hey, Aiden, are you doing tech support for your mom? Um, how many years have that happened? Marsha, I mean, you all are the ones who supported me, and we support each other. You know, I've made many mistakes, and I've grown over the years, and I've gotten better and stronger because of this community. And so I think that's my thing, is <clears throat> doing the work that supports each other, as Marsha said, in the spirit of love and learning. 
not in the spirit of just accountability and call out. It's just so difficult now, but we all make mistakes. We can all get better. And I'm so grateful for the people that are here. Some of y'all, I don't even know. Thank you for what you do. <laughs> but everybody else, thank you. And thank you for the amazing work that you do. And thank you, HRC, for this great opportunity this evening. That's great. I love you. I love your enthusiasm. And, you know, this is the first of uh, uh, a series of events that we're hoping to continue so that we can continue to build on the momentum that we're starting tonight and, and continue to build community and, uh, and dare I say, influence in the organization. So um, the other hand I saw was Brad. So I'm going to try again to see if I can unmute you. Um, we have um, the other room rooms coming back into um, the bigger room. So oh, are they coming back already? Uh, okay. So yeah. Let's so yeah, Brad, if you want to share with everyone, please feel free as long as you're comfortable because <laughs> everyone's back now. You mean by chat? Uh, uh, no, yeah. you can just share it now. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah. I, I just wanted to say that, you know, for a long time, I, I think I sort of denied my Asian background. Um, and it's only been fairly recently within the last few years that I've really started embracing that and, and finding out, like for instance, one of my uncles was at, was interned at Heart Mountain. Um, but our family, that was something that my family never talked about. Um, so I've been, so I went on a pilgrimage a couple of years ago. I've been sharing that with my friends um, because I do want to know, I want, I mean, the, even a lot of my family members don't know what my uncle went through because he never talked about it. So I've been trying to share that with not only my family members, but also with my friends, just so that they acknowledge, you know, what some of our, you know, our relatives, our ancestors have gone through. Um, and so that I, I'm still on a journey. I'm still, you know, getting, trying to work my whole um, Asian identity part out. <laughs> Great, yeah, it is, it is a, a journey, I think, and, and you know, we need to take the steps that, along that. It looks like we're back in the main room or if everyone else has joined, they come back to the main room. So we'll close down this discussion on AAPI visibility and uh, am I handing back to Betty or to Jay? I'm here. Thank you all so much. Um, it, it appears that everyone has had some heartfelt discussions during our breakout sessions, and I'd like to welcome everyone back. We also would love to hear from each of our breakout groups, um, and I'd like to start with Norman on the growing AAPI visibility in LGBTQ plus groups. Norman? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Norman Watkins. Um, I use he, him pronouns, and uh, we had uh, a slow start to our conversation, but it got more lively as, as, um, as time went on. And I wanted to share that um, it, it takes a lot of courage and self-awareness to overcome a lot of the stereotypes that many of us feel. Uh, many of us have internalized stereotypes. Um, and uh, one of us made the point that it, it is uh, lonely to be an Asian activist. So building community is especially important for, for us and um, Jennifer uh, had a wonderful suggestion. She said that uh, when she started to learn how to participate in groups, she would ask one small question. She set a goal for herself to ask one question, just to have a, a moment of participation and engagement. Uh, and, and one small success built upon another, and she was able to uh, find her voice and, um, and contribute to the organizations to which she belongs. Um, and uh, we had another member of our discussion um, comment that uh, in a that we bring a spirit of love and learning, which I thought was a, a wonderful phrase, uh, bring a spirit of love and learning to, to our activism and our engagement. So um, with that, I will pass it to the next, uh, to the next group. Thank you. Thank you so much, Norman. We really appreciate that. Uh, Manal is going to talk about the key points in addressing cultural and social biases within the AAPI community. Thanks so much, Betty. My name is Manal, pronouns 
So the first question we posed to the group is what are some social and cultural biases in the AAPI community and what have um, been your experiences with them? And we had a really good discussion and really vulnerable and honest discussion about the different um, social and cultural biases, which included how folks felt that a lot of the biases are rooted in generationality, um, shame factors, expectations, um, as well as social biases within our community and lack of representation of more ethnic minority groups within our community itself. Um, also feeling the feeling of not fully belonging anywhere with our, our intersectionality being queer and a, in the AAPI community. We also talked about how people in our community can support one another and one of the aspects we talked about is learning more about all of the communities and all of the identities that make up our community as well as having um, non-AAPI and straight allies in the movement and talking about the power numbers, but also recognizing the power of our own voices and how our voices together are louder. So really establishing our community and supporting one another as we are today. Thank you, Manal. That's an incredible, concise synopsis. I really appreciate that. Um, now we're moving on to Chloe on creating and fostering effective allyship. Hey, everyone. Um, uh, Chloe Vasipoli, she, her pronouns. Um, so our group focused um, mostly on the concept of showing up, standing up, and raising up. Um, showing up um, is kind of the, the political formula for democracy um, and standing up and making your voice heard. Um, and then also raising up and engaging in existing structures that, um, that pr promote um, politics and, and discourse. Um, and then also we, we really emphasized and talked about um, opening the door for more AAPI folks um, in politics and um, engaging and raising the profiles of out communities, specifically in kind of um, uh, communities where there are a plethora of um, AAPI individuals, such as Chinatown, um, as well as in Hawaii. Um, and uh, so that was kind of our discussion focus. That's incredible. I, for one, can't wait to see the um, power that AAPI uh, political activists can come to the platform as far as um, representing us in, in um, the political realm. So thank you for that. And now we're moving on to Manel Mina in creating and fostering effective allyship. The role Nina? of Mina will be played by Nicole Cozier this evening. Uh, <laughs> I'm Nicole, she, her pronouns. I am the DEI team at HRC. Um, we had a great conversation uh, in our allyship group. Uh, so a, a few of the kernels that came out of that that were really powerful. One, just remembering the foundation of love that's so critical. Marcia spoke so much about this, but when we're engaging in allyship, we have to come from a place of love and a deep sense of shared humanity. Um, and from that, we also find the opportunities that no matter what divides us, there are often points of connection that give us a really important entry point. Um, and so those become really important places for us to find ways to each other uh, and to support each other um, and one of um, a frame that was offered um, was uh, four E's, the exposure, experience, education, and empathy, and using those as a foundation for allyship practice. So you need to be engaged and exposed to communities. You need to understand the experience of what it means to be in that community, and you have to educate yourself about that. It's not somebody's job to educate us. We have to be uh, the seekers of our own education, and those three then lead to a place of empathy, which becomes a critical foundation um, engaging in allyship and standing up for each other. We also need to bring our education from things like this home. So don't just come to these meetings. We are here. That's fantastic. But what do we do with this message? We have to take it to whatever spheres of influence and community that we have uh, and making sure whether that's five people, 500 or 5,000 people that we are communicating these messages. And that is so critical, especially if we're not part of a community. It is our responsibility and our duty to talk about and stand up for and engage with 
not over. Um, don't stand over, don't speak over, but stand for and stand with um, communities that are not ours. It's our responsibility. That is the role of allyship. Thank so you is- so much. Thank you so much for that, Nicole. It really resonates. Um, uh, we do need to amplify and elevate one another's voices collaboratively as a community and as a group. So thank you so much. Um, I want to thank all of our staff and intern partners for those quick reports and to all of you for joining us in the discussions. Um, I'm going to turn this over now to my co-host, Jay, to introduce Telly's video. Yes, I'm so honored uh, to introduce uh, the uh, performer for the evening. Now, we have had much more emotional of a, a summit than uh, any of us expected. And, and now, and, and to add to that emotion, I want to uh, add uh, joy. Uh, Telly Leung, uh, Broadway's own Telly Leung, was a star of Allegiance and Aladdin on Broadway and is here to perform a very special mix of a Broadway and a pop classic that I think speaks to um, our, our identity. And he has a few words for us as well. So uh, you might want to turn off your cameras and, make, and mute your mics now so you can best enjoy Kelly's beautiful performance. Hi, I'm Kelly Leung. Some of you might know me as a Broadway performer. I'm also a member of the AAPI community and a member of the LGBTQ plus community. And I am so honored to be included in this summit. Now, as a proud member of both communities, I am thrilled that that intersectionality is what makes me unique. It makes me, me. And to celebrate that intersectionality, I wanted to share an anthem that I recorded on my second album, Songs For You. And it is a musical intersection of two things that I hold very near and dear to my heart. Broadway and Whitney Houston. I am what I am. I am my own special creation. So come take a look. Give me the hook or the ovation. It's my world that I want to have a little pride in my world and it's not a place I have to hide in life it's not worth a damn to you can say I am what I am I am what I am I don't want praise I don't want pity I bang my own drum, some think it's noise, well I think it's pretty, and so what, if I love each sparkle and each spangle, why not try to see things from a different angle, life is a sham, to you can say, I am what I am. I'll never change all my colors for you. Take my love, I'll never ask for too much. Just all that you are and everything that you do. Oh, I don't really need to look. Very much further I don't want to have to go Where you won't follow I'm holding back again This passion inside Can't run from myself There's nowhere to hide Nowhere to hide I am what I am And what I excuses I deal my own deck sometimes the ace and sometimes the deuces there's one life and there's no return and no deposit for life so it's time to open up your closet life is not worth the damn till you can shout out
what an incredible, incredible performance. What an incredible performance. Thank you so very much. And thank you all again for joining us this evening. Take note, we are only just beginning. We hope you're leaving this evening ready to lean in like we all have. Jay, I would love to get a sense of how everyone is feeling. Everyone, would you please pick up your mobile phones, go to www menti m-e-n-t-i dot com and use the code one two six two five one five eight let us know what is the one word to, to describe how you're feeling right now i, I see, see it. Empowered. empowered thrilled inspired go ahead jay yes full of love energized, motivated. Hopeful, excited, loved, encouraged. Yay, seen, I love that one. <laughs> I love all of these. Respected, wonderful work. Fired up, AAPI and proud. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Connected. Hers. These are so wonderful. Continue oh to goodness. put them in um, as when we're going to build this and, and circulate it to everybody as these uh, grow. Thank you, everyone. We're leaving you tonight with one ask. If you care deeply about our community as much as Betty and me and all those you've heard from today, then sign a petition to stay engaged today. We're going to drop that in that link into the chat. Thank you for adding your name to our petition and please stay tuned in the weeks ahead. We are working on a very special in-person event this coming AANHPI Heritage Month in May. We will keep you posted and thank you all again for joining us. We look forward to seeing each and one, every one of you at our next event in May. See you in May. <laughs>